In this week's video, we're taking a trip to the world's largest building. That's right, we're going to the Boeing factory. I'll admit the tour was a tad awkward considering they're not really making planes there at the moment and, well, everything else that's going on at Boeing, but it was still a fascinating visit. And after exploring the factory, we'll head just across the runway to Payne Field Airport. This airport was voted one of the nicest regional airports in the world. Is it really that good? We'll find out as we hop on one of the few flights that leaves from here, an Alaska Airlines flight to Vegas. All right, there's a Max. No, there's a uh, X. Okay, so this airport is absolutely tiny. I think the the desk doesn't open until two hours before oh, the is next. That what it is? Yeah, so hopefully in like thirty minutes, I guess. <laughs> Quick question with that too: Is there any window seats available? I don't know if that's. Oh, perfect! Thanks for that. We just got to ask nicely. Okay, so it's twelve thirty-two. Flight's at 3.57. I'm gonna go try and do the 80 minute Boeing tour at the factory, because <laughs> it's just over there. Could get a bit tight, but we'll see. UberX, go. Go on. Please give me a quick ride. I'm kind of relying on Uber here. Oh yeah, we got a guy. And he is three minutes away. I'm gonna try and pull this off. I'm gonna try and pull off the one o'clock. It's 12.34 now, we got the one o'clock tour. We'll do that, it'll finish at 2.20. Uber back here, three o'clock, we ride. You see that? It doesn't have an engine on it yet. All right, let's rock. Where's my Chevy Traverse? All right, so just did the tour. No cameras, no phones, not, no pictures, no nothing. Hence why we went black there for a minute. I'm gonna say not bad, probably a tad underwhelming in the actual content, but Still seeing that building, world's largest building by volume, they tell you that many times on the tour. It's truly, it, it, like the scale, you just can't, you can't get the scale any other way than going there. So I'd still recommend doing the tour. It's just interesting to see more than interesting to learn. I probably knew half the stuff, but I'm a bit of a geek. So if you're not as much of a nerd, you probably would get a bit more out of it than I did. Now, I know I keep on emphasizing this, but the building was truly massive. I wasn't able to take any pictures of it. Please. No photos. And I don't want this to turn into a slideshow presentation. I'm not doing a George Russell impression, but... Fine, I will show you one slideshow. Let's just run through some images and I'll explain how the whole thing worked. Basically, on the tour, you start off at the Future of Flight Center. We all sit down in this theater and watch a quick video on a projector about the history of Boeing. And then you go out and get on a bus. They drive you over to the factory and you pull up at the doors. It's big, really big, but not huge in the sense that you might expect when you first arrive. It's incredibly wide, like the building just keeps on going, but it's not that tall. Why? 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 <laughs> According to Wikipedia, it's 35 meters to the roof. It's tall for a factory, but it's not, it's not like it's the Burj Khalifa or anything like that. You go inside and they kind of have these tunnels running all over the place. We take the elevator up to what I want to say is this, the seventh floor and you kind of reach this observation deck. The tour guide, who is this lovely woman, explains sort of the whole production process while you're up there. But I was kind of just mesmerized really because the planes, you look down on them. If you squint a little bit, you can kind of see people wandering around underneath them. These are wide body planes. These aren't 737s. They're huge. They're like 300 plus seat planes. And you're kind of just looking down on them. It's kind of just absurd, really. The only time I've ever experienced something in any way similar was at Hong Kong Airport, where they've got the sky bridge that goes over the taxiway. When you're up there, you're kind of looking down on planes and it's a similar vibe. But here, you're just in the same building as them. So the building itself is also astonishing, not just the view of the plane. They've got four parallel plane assembly lines with these office blocks in between, but you can kind of see through. And so it's just astonishing to look out from this observation deck across multiple lines of of planes. It just keeps on going. I know I just kind of sound like a broken record right now. I think everybody who's just slightly interested in planes should make the visit at some point. Even though the information isn't the best and the tour is heavily reliant on the fact that you get to just go inside the building, it's still worth the money, still worth the time. Even though there was space to fit 15 or 20 planes and there was only five or six in there, this was definitely one of the worst times to visit and it was still astonishing. 
They're not actually building that much here now because they're waiting for the 777 production to start. They're just doing basically 767s, seven freighters, and the military ones because, yeah, 777X seven, seven hasn't started being produced yet. 777-300s seven, aren't being produced anymore, and Dreamliners have all been moved to South Carolina. So, yeah, there's not actually that much going on there. Um, 737 Max, they were talking about moving the production because they're moving the production, or they're going to add an extra line there. And they're talking about, oh, if you come in six months or something, you might be able to see it. But I was reading this morning that the FAA has, they've halted Boeing from doing any more expansion of production due to the, um, the old door plug issue. Also, the door plugs are funny. Someone asked about it on the tour and she's just like, well, it's an ongoing investigation, so I literally can't comment on it. It's definitely an interesting time to be touring a Boeing factory. But all around, ridiculous building, probably not the best tour in the world. Still an interesting place to come and spend a couple of hours. I do have a flight soon, so I'm going to get an Uber in like 10 minutes. I'm going to go buy things in the gift shop, though, just because they've got some pretty cool stuff. We'll check out the future of flight thing. I don't, it didn't look like there's that much to see, so that'll be quick. And then gift shop, and then we'll head out back to the airport. It's only 10 minutes. Okay, the sky deck is cool, but it's also cold up here. <laughs> um, and it's pretty empty. I imagine this place is a lot busier in summer. They've got live air traffic control, which is kind of cool. We've got a scoot plane over here. I'm not sure what this scoot plane is doing. It's just hanging out, it doesn't have engines on it. It's a Dreamliner, I think it's a Dash 8. What are you doing? <laughs> just hanging around. I did Google this one quickly Turns out it was built in 2019 and then stored over COVID. And then in May of 2024, the aircraft was found to have issues with the titanium floor fittings. And so now it's getting rework done to it. It's pretty remarkable to have a four-year-old plane that's only racked up a couple of thousand miles though. Yeah, that guy's just hanging. And yeah, that's just Payne Field runway. And the airport's all the way over there. Anyway, let's go inside. It's cold. <laughs> Push. Pretty cool. It's not that much going on here though. Let's just go see what they got. $360 million. Jeez. So that's a 747 tail. Tail is pretty big. Otherwise there's just a bunch of like infographic signs. Um, what do we got? The Dreamliner fuselage. I guess that's kind of interesting. It's pretty big. The education lab, which looks closed. And then some information about stuff. HEPA filters. HEPA filters about the air quality, cabin airflow stuff. Are you sure about that? I mean, I wouldn't come here just for this. Definitely only come here if you're gonna do the tour as well. I'm a little bit impressed by the size of this tail fin thing. Humongous. The Destiny Laboratory module. I guess let's go in. Oh. It's a little low. Uh. Honestly, it's not very big. I'd probably get a bit claustrophobic. And that's one of the sleeping pods. What is it apparently sleeping in? Sleeping in space is like the best sleep you'll ever get because there's no, like even the world's best mattress won't come close to sleeping in zero G. I'm pretty sure I heard that on like an interview once with an astronaut. That is one thing I'd love to try about going to space. Like obviously I want to go to space, but if I never go to space, that's something that will annoy me. I'll never get that excellent night's sleep. But anyway, it's kind of cool, I guess. You know what else is cool? Wine Tracker Plus. <laughs> it's cold, I've got a cold. Basically, buy wine, get Qantas points, fly around in business class for less than half the price. There you go. I'm gonna pull the worst marketing move of all time and tell you to go watch the last two videos, specifically the ads in them, if you want a proper explainer on how this all works. Otherwise, I'll link Wine Tracker Plus down below in the description. Go subscribe for email and text alerts for some of the best wine points deals or if you just want to support the channel. It's the closest thing we'll ever get to a Patreon. And now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Who actually buys this infomercial stuff? 
30 minutes till check-in, until boarding. Should be right, just gonna get over the other side of that. All right, so we got about 10 minutes until I need to go on board. Within four hours, you can go and do the whole tour and then come back and get your flight. Got quite busy. I guess flights have landed. Pretty cool airport to come to. It's a pretty interesting airport, actually. It's built in the 30s as like a job stimulus thing after the depression. It was used for military for a bit. It was used for like general aviation, stuff like that. And then interesting, actually, Alaska Airlines ran their operations out of here in the 40s when they were just a charter airline obviously well before they became the Alaska Airlines we know today. It was sort of a bit of everything, general aviation, not a huge airport. And then in the 60s when Pan Am ordered 25 747s, Boeing needed a place to build them. And so they got this humongous bit of land just north of this airport, kind of connected to it, and started building 747s there. I think rather astonishingly, they did that all in 26 months, I think is what she said on the tour. It's 26 months from when they started moving dirt to when they rolled the first 747 out. So, yeah, things happen much slower today. I just want to reiterate, 26 months is insane. This was not only 26 months to build the factory, but also roll out the first prototype 747. And this was not some static airframe prototype that they produce today either. Beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful. I realized the doors were made of plywood. This prototype flew for over 20 years, performing over 12,000 flights and was used to get the 747 type certified by the FAA. Construction of this factory was ridiculous by every metric. In March of 1966, Pan Am officially ordered 25 of these new 747s. Three months later, Boeing purchased the land just north of Payne Airport. This site was chosen out of a pretty broad selection of sites due to Payne Field already having a 9,100 foot runway and its proximity to Boeing's existing production facilities just south of Seattle. Pretty much the day that they signed the papers officially purchasing the land, hundreds of construction workers swooped in and started building. Clearing the land wasn't really an easy task either. It was just a big forest full of bears. Like, actually, they on occasion had to shoo away some bears during construction. Five months after purchasing the land, the first roof was being put on the first assembly bay, and things did not slow down from there. The whole idea behind the development of the 747 was to build the initial prototype on the actual production line they would use for the production planes. In under 18 months from Penn, Pan Am's order, the first prototype 747 was beginning production. It's my understanding that they essentially built the production line out as the first prototype moved down the line. Just absolutely crazy stuff. On January 22nd, 1970, the first 747 entered service for Pan Am 46 months after they placed their order. In total, over 10,000 wide body planes have been produced globally and about half of them have come from this admittedly massive factory. The stat that they always like to throw around is that you can fit the entirety of Disneyland inside of this factory. I don't know if that's impressive or not. I guess it is. <laughs> They started doing unofficial tours here, I guess while the factory was still being built, and started offering sort of official factory tours with the first rollout of the 747 in 1968. In the first full year of official tours, they had over 39,000 visitors. In 1984, they built a dedicated tour building, and this was replaced by the Future of Flight Center that we, that we just saw in 2005. Oh yeah, and it's an airport. There's an airport here. So what's the deal with that? Throughout its history, the airport's been like, the locals have been arguing if it should be a commercial airport or not. I think the airport and the county have always wanted it to be an airport, like a commercial airport. More money, more jobs, more, you know, all of that sort of stuff. But the locals were concerned about the noise and about the property devaluation. This has been ongoing in the 70s and the 80s, but then finally in 2015, there was a vote on it and uh, yeah, it got approved basically. So this company, Propeller, what is it called? Propeller, it's on the side of this car. Propeller? Airports or something? I think they're based in New York. They're like an investment company, built this terminal and yeah, they started running flights. Alaska Airlines runs five or six flights a day out of this airport. I wouldn't say it's been a huge success. I think COVID definitely played a role in that because the airport just opened just before COVID. Uh, that's definitely affected things, but yeah, it's a very nice airport. Anyway, let's go, let's go. <laughs> it's just really not very big, but it's a very clean, modern airport. There are jet bridges and I think there's two spots for planes, but it's kind of crazy because the whole airport's just there's a bunch of Boeing planes being stored here. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting place to fly from. Let's put it that way. They've got like nice music playing, tiny dancer. There you go, I think there might be like 10 flights a day. You can fly to Hawaii from here. You can fly to um, Alaska from here. There is a cafe that's not open. 
or not even existing. Gender neutral. Interesting. This is nicer than some business class toilets I've been in. They also really like Adele. <laughs> This place is ridiculous. Also looking for Las Vegas passenger Mariana. And welcome for our guest group fans and also. Awesome. And welcome for our guest group. As we taxied out to the runway, we got a pretty clear view of the numerous 779s lined up, wrapped in this protective green film, waiting to be completed and delivered to airlines. As of September 2024, Boeing has built 32 of these aircraft in total, 28 for customers and four for testing and certification purposes. Now, I believe of the 28 aircraft destined for customers, 12 are going to Emirates, six are going to Lufthansa, five are going to Singapore Airlines, three are going to ANA, and two are going to Qatar Airways. These planes are currently awaiting type certification from the FAA for the 777X program, and there are also issues with the GE9X engines being supplied by General Electric. You might wonder why Boeing continues to build these aircraft if they can't deliver them yet. This is largely just to keep the production line active and maintain the workforce. You don't want to lay off a bunch of skilled workers only to have to rehire them later. Plus, pre-building the aircraft can expedite deliveries once certification and engine issues are resolved. There is some historical precedence for this situation. Back in September of 1969, Boeing had 24 brand new 747 parked outside this very factory. They were waiting for their Pratt & Whitney JT-9D engines. Pratt & Whitney faced delays producing these engines. They were the first high-bypass turbofans used on a commercial jet. These delays back then led to some pretty significant financial challenges for Boeing. It's reported that their debt peaked at $1.2 billion, which was the largest corporate debt ever up until that point. The delay back then was only about two months before they could start delivering these 747s, which helped resolve all of their cash flow issues. As we know, the 747 went on to become a pretty raw success and a very profitable program for Boeing generally. In contrast, the delays with the 777Xs are significantly longer. These planes were originally scheduled to enter service in 2021. It's now September of 2024 and Lufthansa, the launch customer, isn't expecting deliveries to start until 2026. Obviously, the pandemic impacted timelines significantly along with issues related to the 737 MAX, corporate leadership changes and just general ongoing technical and certification challenges. I do believe that Boeing will eventually sort this out. I'm guessing 2026 is a good estimate. I'm definitely looking forward to the day that we get to see these 777-9s take to the skies. Who knows, maybe I'll be on one of the first flights in 2026. We'll see what happens. The flight to Vegas was just a very standard Alaska Airlines economy flight. I had a free seat next to me, that was nice. Got my no sugar coke and the pretzels, got to see some mountains. The approach to Vegas is always pretty cool too, it's just this humongous city of lights in the middle of the desert. I don't know, I find it pretty pretty. I also got to complete my little pilgrimage. I think some people may have missed the irony here. I should probably make it more clear next time. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you haven't already, check out flightformula.com. Go check out, subscribe to Wine Tracker Plus 2. I'll see you all in the next one. Bye. Do you have any airline miles?